Okay, I think we'll get started now. Um, hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Shaheen Farshi now, who is a principal at Lux Capital, which is a firm which invests in uh, energy and technology. Uh, Shaheen's held uh, positions at GM before, uh, as well as other Silicon Valley uh, technology startups. Uh, so, Shaheen. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here today. We're going to have a great panel uh, talking about EVs and what's it going to take to have practical and reliable and economical EVs uh, on the roads. So uh, first I'd like to introduce Professor J.R. DeShazo. Uh, he's an energy and environmental economist, economist here at UCLA and director of the Luskin Institute for Innovation. The Luskin Center is conducting market research on demand for plug-in hydroelectric vehicles and the integration of charging stations into multifamily housing and workplaces. His center is also responsible for developing the EV readiness plan for the Southern California Association of Governments, the largest metropolitan planning organization in the U.S. His center is also developing the charge station deployment plans for the South Bay cities and the Western Riverside Council of Governments. So maybe JR, if you can, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, what I thought I would do is, is just kick off the panel by giving us first an overview of the policies that are, are currently in place or being developed to support um, the, the, the widespread adoption of electric vehicles, and then to identify the key customer segments that are, are potential, uh, potentially developed uh, out there, and then um, kind of go through some of the priorities that I see for policy reform and opportunities um, to make the, the, our region, our city, and our state more EV ready. Um, and so uh, many of you know that there are state and federal tax rebates available for new vehicles, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. Uh, there are a number of efforts that are beginning, um, starting with the, uh, the uh, automakers themselves to educate consumers. Uh, we have a long ways to go here, but there, there, there is public funding now uh, through the Plug-in Collaborative here in California. Uh, there are subsidies for residential charging stations. There are some time of use rates being provided by ut utilities. They vary a great deal across the, the, um, the state. Um, some cities and counties are developing parking and other roadway or, or HOV access privileges to uh, incent and, and create larger private benefits for EV owners. Uh, and then there are a variety of types of subsidies for publicly accessible charging stations. These are charging stations that aren't located at your home, but might be out in the public um, and available to you to kind of, a, and the motivation there is to address range anxiety for EV drivers. And then uh, last but not least, a lot of cities, counties, and metropolitan planning organizations are undertaking various kinds of EV planning uh, trying to identify uh, obstacles and ways of eliminating those obstacles uh, and trying to create a new public infrastructure that address EV drivers' range anxiety. And then also, as I mentioned, in, 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 as ab above, a variety of new incentives. Now, when we think about um, who's going to buy EVs and who's going to drive them the most, um, we, we um, I'm actually not going to start with those that are likely to drive them the most, but I, I want to, I'll emphasize this as we go, we go down the list. Uh, first, we have um, single family residents, uh, municipal fleets, these are cities, counties, utilities, uh, commercial fleets, uh, this would include things like rental cars, car share, UPS, FedEx, et cetera, and then multifamily. And I'm going to continuously make a distinction between multifamily housing that has parking and multifamily housing that does not have parking. Because parking is an essential part of the refueling infrastructure now. We can't talk about refueling EVs without talking about parking and parking policy. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to do then next is th think about how for each of these segments um, th we can improve policies to, to hasten EV adoption, okay? And I, I, with, with very limited time, I'm just gonna give you what, what um, are to me some of the sort of key suggestions for where we might go and what we might change um, as a state. So let me start with uh, single family residents. And let me, actually, let me say, before we get into this, uh, 
The, the market on the automotive side is changing. If you look at over the next two years, one of the things that we see is that we, we are, are moving from an image of the LEAF or an all-electric vehicle um, to images of vehicles that have um, combinations of uh, basically to the, to the PHEVs, the plug-in electric hybrids that have both combustion engines and elect electric drive uh, technologies in them. Um, one of the challenges is that if they have both systems in them, they, 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 they're more versatile, they address consumers' range anxiety uh, more effectively, they also tend to be more expensive. So the, the rebates that are available are somewhat less effective when, when targeting those. Um, that said, one of the greatest challenges, of course, for electric vehicles is, is how you're going to charge them. And I want to suggest to you that given the products that we have on the market right now, and the products we expect to see, and given the, the charging challenges, a key segment to focus on is the single family residences. And the, the key, the absolute most important policy incentive there are the tax rebates. It lowers the purchase price of the vehicle for the, for the, for the, for the, for the driver. Um, and I think we need to, if, if we're going to set priorities uh, for growing this market early, this is this and, and maybe some of the um, the commercial and municipal fleet opportunities are the early opportunities because this is where the uh, cost of charging is going to be least. Uh, but one of the things that you notice right away when you look at the market studies is how low consumer education is. They know very little about EVs. They have lots of misconceptions. They, most, they know almost nothing about the public incentives that are available for the purchase of electric vehicles. The other thing that uh, I think that, that we need to change in, in terms of our focus is the EV community has been focused a lot on level two charging, and that's fine, except that a lot of the PHEVs, especially for single family residents, aren't going to need level two. And given that the cost of charge station installation is one of the biggest barriers that we're going to face in the future, um, identifying those level one opportunities that will support PHEV use is going to be critical. So f the next thing I want to focus on is the multifamily residents. Now, this is important because, as, as I suspect some of you know, in, in the city of Los Angeles, over 51% of all prospective, well, of all residents live in multifamily homes. And the, the estimate for, for EV drivers is, is upwards of 60% live in multifamily homes. And there are many, many challenges in a multifamily setting, if you're a renter or even a, uh, a condo owner, um, to installing charging equipment. There's a, there, there are institutional challenges, there, there, the cost of insulation is higher, the building needs to, to figure out how to recover those costs, many challenges there. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about first multifamily um, re residential opportunities with parking because that's where at least you could put a charge station. And the solution for those residents, um, I think um, there are a couple of things that we can do. Um, one, we need to think a lot more about energy management solutions within buildings. Most commercial and, and multifamily buildings need an energy management control system that, that helps them manage their load over time. And one of the important things that this can do for the, for the EV um, drivers and the building owners is to help avoid costly panel upgrades, circuitry upgrades, substation upgrades, because they, if, if we can convince building and safety and utilities that these um, these monitoring and control systems for a building's energy um, network can, can allow them to accommodate EVs without these expensive upgrades will considerably lower the cost of installing charge equipment. And I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot to learn there. The, the second thing is right now, one of the biggest problems with state policy is EV drivers can get subsidies for charging stations, but multifamily building managers cannot. They are not entitled to those. And so that, that basically means if, if you go to your property manager and say, you know, I'd like to, to, um, I'd like to have a, an opportunity to charge, they have to pay the full cost of that equipment, but you would not, right? And so there are all kinds of interesting tenant and, and, and manager and owner deals being worked out, but, but many of those deals never succeed because it's such a complicated negotiation. The other thing that, that we've noticed is that um, in the charge, in terms of um, the the way that some of the incentives are, are structured, there's a subsidy for the charging equipment, and it's actually keeping the cost of charging equipment high, because nobody wants to sell a piece of charging equipment for less than the subsidy that you can get for it. So um, I think we want to decouple equipment and, and installation um, 
of subsidies and introduce tax credits for sort of all-in uh, installation costs. Now, I, I mentioned multifamily without parking. One of the interesting things is we don't even know how much multifamily housing is without its own parking. That is to say, how many multifamily residents live on streets? And, and if they live on, if they live on streets, park on streets, their cars live on streets. <laughs> if, um, if that's the case, there are really two options. There, there can be curbside or nearby commercial parking, um, in, charge station opportunities created for them, or workplace charging might be their only other option, right? So that's, that's an important piece of this. Um, all right. This is my last slide. And the state of California, and even recently the governor, have put a lot of effort into trying to create a network of publicly accessible charging stations. Uh, there, there are big efforts down in San Diego. Uh, there are statewide efforts to basically subsidize, uh, even give away these opportunities for these uh, charge stations. Uh, there are revenue sharing opportunities between site hosts and charge station operators. One of the big problems that I see is that right now the way the program was set up was basically they, 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 there was the, a lot of money was amassed and given to certain firms to install charge networks. And what they were trying to do is go out and locate charging stations um, in theory where the public was going to use them and, and in theory where they could, um, they could make a profit later on by charging people uh, for charging. One of the problems is that this, this process is not working very well. Um, the, the stations are not being located in areas of high demand. Nobody's really even identified areas of high demand. Um, a lot of the focus has been on uh, level, level two and even fast charging in terms of focus as opposed to lower cost level one options. Um, and there's been very little focus on the, 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 the brutal reality that um, light gas stations, the margins on these stations ultimately is going to be very low in a competitive market setting. Um, and so I, I think we need to go from a supply-side-driven set of policies to a demand and supply-driven side policies. And, and let me just say that one of the challenges right now is we have a mixed market where the government is highly subsidizing the installation of some stations and even the operation. And then we have, we have private firms going in and, and partnering with, with commercial retail establishments and trying to set up charge stations. And you know the, the challenge there is that if the publicly subsidized stations are either by mandate or just by competitive um, proclivity underpricing electricity or giving it away for free, uh, and our long-term goal is to develop a, a, a sustainable um, ecosystem of charge stations, what's happening is when there's that intervention that lowers the cost, which is what we want, right? Um, in a sense, we want, the, we want the early cost of these stations to be low. But what does that do to the, the for-profit um, charge stations that are being developed, right? And, and they're being undercut, essentially, potentially. So we kind of have a mixed model right now. And the governor just announced that there were going to be 67 fast charge stations located in LA County um, over the next three years. And all of those um, stations are going to be um, operated at below cost. So if you happen to be a young entrepreneur trying to get into this, you're scratching your head saying, okay, where's the space for me, right? So I, I think that there's a lot of, um, of, of good economic thinking and, um, and, and planning that we need to do to kind of align our policies. The good news is we're a state with a huge amount of latent demand for, for these um, for these vehicles. And you know, I don't have enough time to talk about commercial and municipal fleets, but there's a huge opportunity there um, to get a lot of electric miles driven by a very few vehicles at the lowest cost in terms of fuel costs possible. Um, and and I, one of the things we're trying to do here at UCLA is support um, models of adoption and utilization in municipal and commercial fleets. So I'll look forward to questions later on. And I don't know who I, I turn it back over to you. Thank you very much.